Yes, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome here in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome here in this place. Holy Potent Father, had mercy. Yes, Holy Spirit, Thou art and here in this place. Yes, Holy Spirit, Thou art well and here in this place. Holy Spirit, Father, and Yes, Holy Spirit, Thou art well, can hear in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art well, can hear in this place. In 
the precious blood of the Lamb. One more time. Yes, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. There is power in the blood. Amen. Hallelujah. There was no other other sorcery try to but did uh, intimidate us, but there is the blood of Jesus. Amen. But, you know, I just want us to go around and greet one another and just embrace one another, the love of God. Amen. Good to see each and every one of you. the natural rain but we need the spirit to let it rain amen Hallelujah. to rain over our family to rain over our our circumstances amen and to rain allow the spirit of God to rain upon each and every one of us send down the rain Lord send down the rain send down
We're going to sing that again. And you know, as I mentioned, you know that dancing. Pastor Kevin, what you read? We, we need to dance in the right name. Well, come on, you come up here first and dance. Start dancing. Get them going, eh? Come on, praise the Lord. If I had, what, didn't have this guitar, I'd be dancing. I want to dance in there because what, what God is doing in our life, my, my brothers and sisters, he's doing a change in our life, amen. You know, we need a change just here this morning, you know, just the prayer that's going on. this morning that you love him. Just tell the Father that you love him. That he will reign in any areas in our life. Amen. In the latter rain, the spiritual rain. Amen. Praise God. Before we come into worship, you know, Pastor Kevin and I and my wife, we go up into the mountains and the Spirit of God, the rain of God just rain down upon us. Because we want to be in the presence of God. God wants us to take it. I believe God wants to take us. I believe that God is is speaking to each and every one of us here this morning. Come back into the altar room of God. You know, we need to build that altar, love us. You need the latter rain. You need the fallen rain. You need revival in that room to rain over your family, to see him come through these doors. Amen. It's the latter rain. Amen. I sing praises to your name.
worship him this morning. Oh, just worship him, sing out to him, cry, cry out to him this morning. Again, with a shout of his voice, I sing praises to your name. Let the song to be a prayer this morning. Praises to your name for your name is great. So Worship in this morning, hallelujah. I sing praises to your name. Oh Lord, praises to your name. Oh Lord, for oh, your name is great. So great. Be great. I give glory. this morning. Oh, Lord, we give glory to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and great be praised. I give glory to your name. I give glory to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great, so great. Be praised. I sing praises to you, baby. I sing praises to you.
sing it again. Majesty. Yes, Majesty. Let's worship Him then this morning. Worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your hands to the Lord right now? And we are in a state of prayer and believing God. And we're going to pray for Ray this morning, who hasn't been well, and Mary too. And maybe you're sick this morning. Maybe you have an infirmity or a problem or something that is troubling you in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's physical. Maybe it's just something that comes across your mind, your heart, your emotions, something that you don't want and you believe is detrimental to your breakthrough in God. Well, I just want you to step forward. I'm going to anoint you with oil. According to the scriptures, if uh, 
Ronnie, you can give me that little box of oil there. Thank you. That's the man. Thank you. We'll just come around like that. And uh, every, well, everybody in this church believes, of course, but I just want you to come around and we're going to pray. How many believe that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or even imagine? You know, sometimes we ask, sometimes beyond our asking, we're thinking and imagining and thinking, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? God's able to do better than that. Amen. You've asked for prayer, Ray. We give you the first opportunity to be prayed for. Right now. Pastor Peter, come and join me. Come, Eunice, and join me. Amen. Hallelujah. Sister Venus, you're here, part of our ministry team. Come and join me right now. We're going to anoint Ray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for your hand to be upon your servant for a mighty and an amazing and miraculous healing to take place in his body. And I pray that he will know this day that you've touched him in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Mary right now. Lord, she's a woman of faith and we anoint you right now in the name of Jesus and we believe for the healing power of Jesus Christ to meet your need on every level of your being and to deal with anything that in any way troubles you or affects you or tries to bring you under or down. We resist it, we rebuke it, and we praise God that you're on the throne, Lord Jesus, not our infirmities, not the accuser of the brethren, not any man, potentate, priest or king. We thank you that Jesus is Lord and we praise him and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I take it that you're here not just for your good looks, you're here to be prayed for. We anoint you joy in the name of the Lord. Let the peace and the blessing and the healing power of Jesus flood your handmaiden this morning. Bless her right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Put your hand towards Joy. She needs a double blessing. I feel that. I'm going to pray again. In the name of Jesus, bless her. Bless her. I pray the joy of the Lord will break over her and from within her like a glorious fountain that out of her innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. I believe in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I do. What are you loving at? <laughs> oh, I know you do. This is Jackie, not Anassas. She's got better riches than that. Father, we pray right now that you will deal with this condition in the name of Jesus. I pray you'll dispense with it by the word of your power. Lord, bless her in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. David, are you looking for prayer? Yeah. Are you? Good. This man is famous in this church. But he's famous because his cousin is Judith Durham, the singer of the Seekers. You don't even know who they are, do you? Oh. He's been away too long. In the name of Jesus, I pray for David that you'll touch him, that you'll heal him, that you'll make him well, and that you'll deliver him from all infirmity. And Lord, he'll be pain-free because he's disease-free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. They get better looking as we pray for them. Sister, what would you like? A healing this morning? We will pray in the name of Jesus. You'll bless your handmaid and touch her. Oh, I pray, minister life and healing in the name of Jesus. Bless her abundantly. Let the power of the Spirit of Jesus quicken her according to your word. Amen. Amen. Brother, you want prayer. You're not well or you just want something from God? Okay. Good. Greg, pray for, for our brother right now. 
in the name of Jesus. He wants healing and he wants the blessing of God. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes, so well. Thank you, Lord. Oh, bless him. Bless him. Bless him, bless him, bless him, bless him. Thank you, Father. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I believe God's got something for you. It's going to be good. Right, I do. I believe that. I know that's true of everyone, but but then God has got specifics. What do you want? I'm on the way. I'm on the way. <laughs> that's Joy. She's very bossy. <laughs> but we love her. Loretta, in the name of Jesus, we pray for this spinal condition. We pray that every part of her body will glorify you by a divine healing, a divine touch, and a miracle of grace in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you will bless her in such a mighty way that she will be a continuing testimony to all who know her and all who know about her condition in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Estrita, come here. Are you praying for the condition that your dancing brought about just a little while ago? Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. God bless you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, bless us, Escrita. I pray you'll touch her body and I pray you'll make her totally well. I pray that into her being will flow the mighty touch of God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And Dawn, is it Dawn? Did, did you say Dawn? Dell. No, dear. All right, Eunice, you go and pray for Dell. And while you're praying for Dell, I'll pray for a number of that are watching us that are not well. Surely, we pray for you right now. We lay our hands by faith upon you and we pray healing virtue into your body. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you will touch your handmaiden and bless her abundantly. We pray for our brother John Burks, Lord. We pray that you'll touch him and bring him right through from this operation that he had on Friday. I pray that you will increase strength and bless him in his soul, his mind, his whole spirit. I pray you liberate him in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray right now, Lord, for any others that may be in need. We pray for Ryan, Lord, just down the road, and yet we pray for him. Father, that you will bless Ryan today. You'll touch him. You'll bless him. You'll anoint him with fresh oil. You'll give him a remarkable deliverance in the name of Jesus. He will feel better. He will feel strong because he is, because of your grace and your tender mercy. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I want you to do something. I want you to lift these marvellous hands and arms. Aren't you glad you can? Now I want you just to start praising God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Open your lips. Show forth His praise. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We give you glory. You are a mighty God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we worship you. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Yes, give the Lord a bit active. Hallelujah. I was hoping Eunice would stay around a bit so I could wipe my oily hands on her. But thank God for those that put these tissues here. Well, welcome this morning and praise God. Um, there's a great celebration in the air, or yesterday was the main celebration again this morning for Pastor Les Hanaway. He reached the marvellous age of 80. So uh, I rang him yesterday and he was just coming out of the celebratory afternoon tea. 
And of course it was filled with uh, Hinaway families and associates. Were you there? Were you there, girls? Oh, yes, yes, they were there. And uh, so many others were there and they had a wonderful time. I'm very offended I wasn't invited, but um, there you go. You can't be at every party you'd like to be at. But I rang him and on your behalf and on my own and Eunice's, we wished him a, a great God bless you. Pastor Les has been a phenomenal influence and had tremendous impact in this whole region for many decades. And so hitting 80 is wonderful, isn't it? Praise God. And uh, we thank the Lord for that. Well, praise the Lord. Now, after communion this morning, uh, the children can go out and uh, Eunice and Leah will welcome them and they won't entertain them, they'll bless them. And Leah has wonderfully uh, consented to take over the children's work from Eunice and uh, this is going to be a wonderful thing. Eunice will help Leah as Leah has helped Eunice. Isn't that great? That's the way it goes. So praise God for that. Amen. You may be asking, uh, we haven't had the induction of those that are on the ministry team. Well, the reason is our brother Tay is working shift uh, work and we want to make sure that he is here uh, and doesn't have a sudden change of shift at times so that he can be part of that. So that's the reason. We had scheduled um, a meeting tonight, a, a gala night at our house, and uh, government has uh, forbidden uh, not the gathering. That's fine, as long as we uh, are uh, obedient to the COVID restrictions and demands. That's okay. But we can't serve food. And it's a fellowship tea, which is not the main reason we're here, but certainly we didn't want just another meeting. And so we're not having it this week. We're going to wait until those restrictions are lessened and we're able to serve tea, or we're able to serve it in a way that is, uh, is allowable. So uh, there are some um, details that we need to know, and it was left a bit late, the changes of demand, and, uh, but we're not under the restrictions, let me make it very clear, we're not under the restrictions of southern Queensland, including as from 8 o'clock in the morning, that's Monday morning, uh, Toowoomba and other places as well. We thank God that we are free of a lot of those restrictions, but we can't serve food in a buffet manner, which is our normal way on a gala night. So we're, we're not having it tonight, so have a night off and, and uh, we'll look forward to it when we can be all together and have that uh, lovely fellowship under the stars and then gather around at our home and worship the Lord. So wasn't it great to see Pastor Tim and, and the family? God bless you, leading. Praise God. It always brings a blessing. When I parked my car this morning, I stopped and sat there for a few minutes and thought, I'm going to hear the music. I heard nothing. I came down the runway over the, the side of the car park and onto the street. I heard nothing. I thought, don't you tell me that he didn't turn up and he thinks it's Saturday or Thursday or Monday. But here you were praying and praise God for that. So if there's anything better than singing, it's praying and God blesses us. Praise God. Now a couple of things we'll mention later at the conclusion of the meeting when we receive the tithes and offerings. And thank you for, for giving so faithfully. This is a very awkward time in Australia. It's different to some of the overseas countries who are smaller in size. We all have in different regions, not only different states, but different regions. We have different demands and restrictions. And thankfully, we are in the least uh, restrictive area. And we do thank God for that because it lets us move around fairly freely. And we have no known cases of uh, the virus um, that are out there in our community. We praise God for that. But we do pray for those that are under heavy restriction. We need to pray for Victoria and parts of Melbourne particularly where the suicide rate has risen dramatically. 
and domestic violence and alcohol consumption and drug taking. And there are many people that just can't cope and can't face and can't stand the isolation and the privations that that brings. And so, Father, we pray, not so much for the happy Christians that are fulfilled in you and loving uh, one another, loving you and having your peace and presence in their lives, but we pray for the lonely, we pray for those that are hold away in little bed sitters and flats and feel so isolated and those with mental trauma and emotional upheavals, we just pray, God, that you will send people that know you to them, that they might know you and have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Give the governments of our various states and territories wisdom and guidance. Thank you for them. Look, uh, an unenviable task, an unenviable role. But Father, with your grace and your help, Lord, we will not only succeed, but your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. We're coming around the Lord's table this morning and it's a very simple, a very simple reflection. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. I remember my dear friend who went to be with the Lord a number of years ago, Iron Morgan, great expository preacher, Welsh-born and international speaker, former principal of the Commonwealth Bible College and one of my dear friends. He said to me, Tony, I go to various churches in my capacity as a, a pastor and a preacher, a guest preacher, and we have communion in most of our churches, or did at that time, every Sunday morning. It's not so today, which is a disappointment to me, but anyway, that's everybody else's business, not mine. He said, when I go to people's places to minister, churches that is, I'm amazed the variety of themes that the leader of the communion table will give anything but the cross, anything but the broken body, the poured out life, the precious blood. And he said, and yet that's the whole foundation of our redemption and that's what we're to remember. So I shared with him that my focus when I come week by week in our case, at any time that I take communion, whether privately or corporately with the body of Christ, the focus is Jesus, amen? Because the Apostle Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians 11 that when Jesus took the bread and he took the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And that's where the focus is, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus is the one that gets us to heaven. Jesus is the one who sustains us so that on the way to heaven we receive his blessing, his joy, his peace and his presence. As you receive the emblems this morning, receive them not from those that are, the, uh, those that are asked to distribute them, but receive them from the hand of Jesus himself. The disciples did that on that great night, sadly of betrayal, when he was about to be offered up without spot unto God. The Jews not knowing, the Romans not caring, the disciples bewildered and torn apart mentally, emotionally and every other way. Jesus said, take this as my body. It is broken for you. And then after they had supped, he took the cup and he said, take all of you drink this in remembrance of me. It's so simple, but it's so sacred, isn't it? And so as we stand this morning, would you stand, having received the emblems or in the process of receiving them? Anyone not received them yet? Okay, so we're yet to do that completely. But we hold these emblems 
And we don't even remember the communion, we remember him. Can you imagine him handing you the broken bread and the cup and saying to you, do this in remembrance of me, don't forget me. I am the central figure. I am the foundation of your faith. I am the one, the only one, that is Lord and Saviour. And so we receive this not from the hands of a member of the congregation, but from the hands of the Lord himself. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you feel like saying hallelujah to the Lord? Do you feel like thanking him? Wherever you are around the world today watching us on live streaming, just thank the Lord for his goodness. Many of our folk in their own homes, others that are not well, just thank him for his goodness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the saviour of the world, the saviour of our soul. And we take the bread and we eat it in remembrance of him. Yes. And after the same manner, we take the cup. And we remember the chorus, O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white snow, no other fount, I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let us drink it all. And all of us drink it in his name. Amen. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we receive the certainty and the assurance of our salvation. Amen. 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 You may be seated. 1962, my goodness, that's almost a millennium away, isn't it? 1962, I went to church as a probably a 17-year-old. Children are going out and the youth... I was, at, I was at church and they said next month a group will be coming back from England and they have been there for some time and uh, they're coming back. And those that had been in the church when this family had gone, all praise the Lord, and we who had come in since their departure said, oh well, praise God, that's good and thought nothing more of it. But uh, a couple of weeks later, they were there in the meeting. I think there were five children, mother and father, and they'd been in England and been in a place where they'd had a real quickening from the Lord. And I guess the second son, would it be, Peter? You're the second son. Little Peter Adkin was there with his older brother, Ian, and their older sister, Pat, who was a formidable member of our youth uh, group. Very bossy, but lots of fun. And then the younger members, uh, Gillian and David, and their parents, Len and Phil. And Peter's here today. He's uh, living now down further south, within the boundaries of Queensland, so he and his wife Shelley are with us, and they're in the fellowship this morning. Would you like to stand up, and let's give them a warm welcome. God bless you both. Peter was the best looking one of the whole family, weren't you, Pete? Yes, I think so. And uh, everyone liked Peter, but he was the quietest of them all and didn't say much, but I tell you what, it was all ticking over in, inside. I remember those days so well and the impact of his family on my own life. My parents were utterly opposed to the gospel and they were utterly opposed to my commitment to Jesus. And uh, nonetheless, my mother was very kind enough and father to allow me to have a birthday party. And all the youth came 
and that caused a hullabaloo, a lot of fun, and you know, a lot of uh, now in this world, uh, a lot of gaiety, meaning a lot of joy. And uh, to pick up his children, Mr. Adkin came, and I walked out into the kitchen, and he was holding forth, telling my mother and father all about the gospel. And you know, to my amazement, they listened fervently, listened avidly. He was quite an impressive man, a school teacher by, a trade teacher by, by uh, profession. He knew how to communicate, a good preacher. And he was telling them how they could get saved. And rather than being infuriated and enraged like they usually were, they were wrapped, even my very conservative dad. And they were listening and I thought, Wow, because I could tell the difference of attitude. And when Mr. Adkin had taken his hoard home, my mother said to me, he makes sense. She said, I like him. She didn't think anyone else in the church made sense, but she liked him. Didn't think Billy Graham made any sense, but she liked Mr. Adkin. She thought he was a, a good representative of the gospel. Praise God. Well, let's turn in our Bible to the well-known scripture and it's found in Proverbs, <coughs> Proverbs chapter 3. You probably, as I can do, quote this, probably verbatim, but I still like turning to the Bible and, and reading it. I'm reading from Proverbs chapter 3 and... Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Now, verse 7 is a commentary of attitude, and it follows on. It says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And the consequence of that, verse 8, is it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So, in other words, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. This is a marvellous uh, scripture and I think if we hear it once, we hear it a dozen times in our home. Eunice loves this scripture. You see, our lives are built on trust unswervable trust, and it's not in each other. It's on the Lord and in the Lord. And that's the important thing, trust in the Lord. We live in an era right here, right now, right at this moment in time. We live in an era where trust is crumbling overnight. Things you, things I, things we trusted in for decades, for generations, for the millenniums have now been proven untrustworthy. And there are two that are vying for our trust. One is Almighty God his Son, our Saviour, and the Antichrist, the God of this world, the God who is in defiance of all that Jesus stands for and is. They are vying for our trust. Not only ours, but every single person on earth. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 in the King James Version, we have this scripture, whatsoever things are true, pure, good, worthy, consider 
and set your mind on those things. And then the peace of God will garrison your heart. We are living in a day and an era which is really not frightening if you are a Bible-believing Christian. And to be a Bible-believing Christian, you must be a Bible-reading Christian. And out of what you read, you start relying on and believing. Whatsoever things are true. Now, the Bible says that there was going to come a day and we turn to the minor prophet Haggai and this expresses the day, the era that we are in right now. Listen to what it says in the book of Haggai. Unusual name, isn't it? Haggai. And Haggai has a little book of only two chapters. But he says something most profound in verse 6 of chapter 2. Listen to what he says. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. He's talking about the restoration of the temple after the Babylonian exile. But as with all Bible prophecy, it has dual application. It can be certainly and even primarily for a certain time and a certain time which was immediate to Haggai's ministry. But he's also looking down the corridor of time prophetically to a day in the end time when that will be shaken, that world will be shaken, all that is part of that world, its philosophy, its power, its authority, its securities, governmentally and in wealth, there will be such a shaking in the nations until that which is unshakable is left. And my friends, I want to tell you that right at this moment we are in that shaking process. And we are seeing people who are being deeply affected by the shaking. And the reason why you would be deeply affected by the shaking is that you put your trust in this world. You put your trust in a numerous amount of things that possibly you felt you weren't trusting. You would have theoretically, philosophically said, oh no, that's not where my trust is. But it's surprising how shaken, nervous, tense and full of anxiety we become when our world is being shaken. We are coming to a place too where the shaking will continue and in the prophet Daniel, right at the beginning of his prophecy in chapter 2, and verse 6 to 9, he talks about a disintegration of the powerful nations, a ten kingdom rulership over the world that would be destroyed by the coming of the kingdom of Christ. Now, we are in the place right here and now of shaking. We are being shaken as a world of nations. And we as Christians feel the impact of that. And we have to find our place in God. And we have to find our place of ministry in God. We have to find our place with the message, how to declare it, how to encourage, how to comfort, how to warn and how to sustain people. Because many people like our neighbour, very next door to us, who said to Eunice when she went on just an errand, 
of not much consequence. And he said to Eunice, we are in a terrible state in the world today. He said, I am quite fearful of what is going to happen next. I have three children and I have no idea what is happening to my business economically, what is happening in Australia and the world politically, what is happening in the world morally. He said everything is upside down and inside out and fragmenting every day. And he said, what in the world is happening? That came out of the voice, the words, the mouth, the mind, the heart of a good wholesome man who felt that his security was sure just 12 months ago. Now, could be on the brink of bankruptcy. Could be on the brink of absolute chaos on many levels of his presumed security. So we're in the shaking period. And we're not smug about it because we know that so many people are caught up and like a whirlpool are being sucked in and haven't the ability to swim and survive. I'm a little annoyed when Christian friends, and I have some, who are in places of severe lockdown who say, oh, praise God, it doesn't matter. It's okay. It's okay for them. It would be okay for me. I can sustain myself. I can entertain myself. I have an assured income that at this stage can't be touched or undermined or stolen. So it's okay with me. But I'm not the world and the world doesn't revolve around me. What about those that are in those towers that have had to be removed and offered alternative accommodation outside of where they've been in North Melbourne and Flemington because they are going crazy. I had a very dear friend, educated, Christian, and formerly a pastor's wife, who said to me recently, just two weeks ago, I'm going stir crazy. I can't get out, I can't go and visit my sons who are unwell, I can't see my grandchildren, I'm only allowed to go to the supermarket or emergency places like doctors or dentists or chemists and then I've got to come straight home and I can only go on my own. I can't go with a friend or a neighbour or anything. She said, I'm going crazy. So there are people who are not in any way, shape or form really coping with the shaking. Now, just because you are, get out of the way and stop thinking about yourself and being smug and praise God, oh, I don't mind this, this is fine, this is okay by me. Well, it's not okay by those that haven't the resources, the capacity, the roots, the assurance, the strength and the spirit of God to keep them stable like you. So what do you do about it? Sit around smugly? Eat another chocolate? Drink another coffee? Put on another DVD? Or do you start praying for those that are desperate and those that are turning upon themselves, upon those that they are living with in their isolation, exercising their tempers in domestic violence, and self-harm, and even suicide. We need to reach these. The Bible tells us there's coming a day in Psalm 46 when the mountains will be cast into the sea. That's what it says. The Bible tells us this. We will not fear making a difference between the unbeliever and the believer, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. There is a day coming according to the Revelation, the last book of your Bible, in chapter 8, 
and verse 8 where it says, the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. Now you know from history in your school that often the sea was regarded as the sea of humanity. And Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, that the sea would be filled with waves that were roaring. In other words, there would be toxic upheaval in the world among the nations. We're in that state right now. Now, if you've got the peace of God, praise God. I have, you have, we have. So we who know the way, the truth, and the life have a role to play, a ministry to extend to those that are full of anxiety, full of fear, not knowing what's happening. They have no idea of the calendar of God. They have no idea of the prophecies that are there. Now, to these, I would say, identify the roots of your anxiety. With any anxiety, and many of us will cope with anxiety somewhere along the line in life's journey, sometimes it's very evident and very easy to identify why we're anxious. We're anxious because our world has been shaken. Our confidence has been abused. Our security is unsettled. Our trust has been betrayed. The demolishing of trust. It's terrible when that happens. Ask any woman, ask any man who trusted the vows they made in the covenant of marriage only to find they'd married a monster or married a situation or into a situation that caused them to come to a place of separation where someone they trusted, someone they loved, someone they were devoted to, who they honestly and sincerely promised at the altar on the day of their wedding that they would be bound by vows until death do us part, only to find that the marriage died before they did. And the abuse of trust is a terrible thing. You'll hear people say, well, I'll never be able to trust again. Well, I just want to go through some of the, the foundations of the world that have been shaken and the trust that has been broken by our world as a result. They tell us that the persons and the office of politicians are today the least trustworthy. People don't believe politicians. That's what they, the survey says. They are at the top of the list. You can't believe in leadership. Wow. Don't you see how significant that is and how dangerous that is? If you can't believe what you're being promised, what you can't believe, what a political party is undertaking to bring about. And the Bible says that the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things. The Bible tells us that the Lord sits in the heavens, Psalm 2, verse 4. He looks upon the leadership of humanity and laughs and holds them in derision. Why? 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 Because of verse 2, the rulership, the politicians of this world have largely... defied, this is what it says, the Lord and his anointed. 
Now, they may have made lip service 100 years ago, 50 years ago, lip service to the things of God and God himself. Parliaments, both federal and state, in Australia, in America, in the Senate, always commenced with prayer. The Senate in America had its own chaplain. And we in our federal capital always commence the parliamentary year in a designated church. And all politicians from the leaders of both parties and all parties and their teams are requested and required to be there. And there is honour even if their hearts are far from him. There is a sense of putting God at the head and the helm of a nation. But the Bible tells me in chapter 2 that leadership, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together and our laws of the last five years, seven years, ten years will prove that this is true. They take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. Abortion is against the word of God, the killing of the innocent. Now euthanasia is on the agenda of our state parliament. And you have an opportunity now. You may not be able to stop because we live in such a permissive generation. You may not be able to stop it going through and even being endorsed, but your voice should be heard. Even as a witness... According to Ezekiel chapter 3, according to Ezekiel chapter 33. The prophet Ezekiel was never given the assurance that when he spoke to Israel and warned them of pending judgment, that Israel would turn and repent. But what God did say to him was that if you do not speak and they romp ahead towards their self-destruction and the judgment of God, their blood I will require at your hands. So we have a, a necessity to email or write a letter or even present ourselves at our local member at his office or her office and say, we would like to register our disapproval. This is anti god And it doesn't matter whether they laugh at you if they, when they've closed the door and politely have shaken your hands and thanked you for your your contribution and laugh you to scorn while you get into your car and drive off. It doesn't matter. You have spoken as a witness. Light and salt you have become to a dying world. So politicians and lawmakers and even, sadly, law enforcers are the least trusted in our modern society. So statistics say. Little children find it very hard to trust mummy and daddy. And our children, who are our pride and our joy, are finding it hard when the marital vows that our parents took have been discarded rubbished, repudiated by adultery, by violence, by pettiness, whatever the cause, the children are not able to trust. And Jesus said something in Matthew's Gospel which chills me to the bone. He spoke of divided homes. He spoke of divided and fragmented families. In the 10th chapter of Matthew, I read these words. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. My husband, my enemy was a book that was written some time ago where a woman was murdered by her husband in the leafy streets of manly Sydney. The husband, a hotelier, 
paid for a gunman to come into the home and in the dead of night shoot her dead, which he did, and that man only was released a few years ago back into society after 23, 25 years of being in prison. I thank God for a stable home. And you will do the same when you look back if you had a stable home. There was no drunkenness in our home. There was no insecurity in our home. I never heard my father raise his voice. I know they disagreed. My mother had a tremendously uh, electric personality. She had a mind of her own. She was allowed to express it. And if it in any way, shape or form collided with my father's will and his purpose and his opinion, they would have discussed that. I never heard it. It was behind closed doors. So I grew up cheeky because I was free, happy because I was safe, secure because I had none of that. I never heard a raised voice. I never heard a slammed door. I never heard a threat. I never heard that. And that's why I talk about it because this is common today where children are growing up in toxic attitudes and listen and we say, look, I don't know what's wrong with our kids. I can't understand why they won't do as I say. They won't do what you say because you don't do yourself what you demand of them. So enmity creeps in to our own homes. And those of our household can be our worst enemy. So a lack of trust. I asked someone why they didn't choose to marry, but rather live together. They said, oh, I did that once. I married once. Didn't work. And so now they're living together because what they had sincerely entered into turned out to be so sad, so savage, so undermining, so unfulfilled, so disappointing, so heartrending. And so they don't trust marital vows. They don't trust parents, some kids. They don't trust family values. They don't trust the old picture of a home with a picket fence and the roses entwined and the cosy sofa behind or beside a fire, mum knitting, dad sitting back, dozing as he reads the newspaper. They don't believe in that. That doesn't exist for so many today. So they don't trust parents and home. The other day, I was shocked when a man suffering a terminal disease with great pain, terrible agony, and I saw it with my own eyes. I said to his wife, isn't there something we can do? Isn't there something the doctor can give him? Oh, no, she said, he won't take any medication because he's fearful that the doctor will administer something that will take his life. And I thought about that on my drive home, and I thought today increasingly, to the amazement of both politicians, chief medical officers, and the medical fraternity, be it doctors or nursing staff, there is a concern and a quandary why are people increasingly not trusting the advice of the medical fraternity? Well, it's because the medical fraternity have become part of the team in abortion, even advocating it in some quarters, not all, of course, but in some, advocating abortion, the taking of the innocent life, being the ones to allow for euthanasia, giving the okay, signing the document, okaying for it to go ahead, and even experimentation. So the uneducated 
And the weakened, physically, emotionally, and limited mentally, educationally, intellectually, say, I don't want a doctor anywhere near me. No one would have thought that. 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And yet that's becoming familiar, it's becoming common. And it's not the first time I heard. I heard it first in 1969, when someone suddenly, who was definitely sick with a terminal disease, suddenly died. And I heard, because I like to listen, I heard someone say, I reckon they just deliberately gave them a double dose of morphine and that took them. Well, it may have been, or maybe it was coincidental. But we are in a terrible plight if we cannot believe the medical fraternity. When you put your life into the hands of a surgeon or even a GP and they prescribe certain tablets, I was given some tablets, and then when I went for my annual blood test in February, March, they said, oh, something's happened in your blood cells. I said, really? Yes, they said, uh, last year it wasn't a problem, but it is now. And so we went on one of those uh, horror, you know, continual trips in and out of specialists, playing, paying enormous amounts of money. Thank God for Medibank Private. But still, it was a hefty piece only to find out that a doctor had prescribed, in good faith, medication that was attacking my body. So that was withdrawn, and I heard last week that there's nothing to worry about now because it's been two months since that tablet was taken. Now, I don't, for one moment, go with trembling to a specialist and think, oh, can I trust them? Do they really want to end my life or what's going on? Am I being experimented on? I don't have those thoughts. But you see, I'm not sick and I'm not troubled. And then another structure that has been questioned, abused and now not trusted, would you believe the church? When you go down to the marketplace and sit with people and start talking, they'll say to you, Oh, you're a Christian, are you? And you say, yes, happily, positively, strongly, humbly. And they'll say, don't believe in Christianity. Why? Oh, I need to read the papers. The criminal conduct of those who did know better, who used their position to destroy people's lives, morally, sexually, and in so many other areas, flamboyantly leading in some form of worship and yet living as pagans. That's why we need to be repenting in prayer before God that he'll send a revival to this country and awakening to this country, a revival to the church and an awakening to the whole nation that Jesus be preached, that Jesus be seen, not the institutionalized, even sacramental, even evangelical, even Pentecostal church who peddles a, a doctrine and a gospel of allowance. We don't want that. We want to get back to the Bible. We want to get back to prayer. We want to get back to the Holy Ghost. We want to get back to what God is saying and God is doing in this day and age. People don't trust the church. I had a phone call from a man I've never yet met, from an akin uh, Pentecostal church, and he said to me, my father is a pastor, and he's one of these um, faith ministry devotees. You know, uh, you sort of... Um, Fake it till you make it. You know, you, you, you say things that aren't so and believing they will be. And I said, oh, yes. He said, well, it's really upsetting because he's just had a heart attack and he didn't believe that that would ever happen to him. Oh, I said, he believes, on heaven on, he believes in heaven 
on earth, in earth, and in his body. And uh, yes, he said, I don't hold to it. He said, it's an extreme and it's ridiculous. But he said he's in Townsville Hospital and he, and he needs someone to go and encourage him and pray with him. Would you do that? Your name came to mind. But he said, Pastor, to get it, could you give him a bit of a... Look, don't go in on the heavy spiritual thing because he said, uh, you know, he's, he's in a terrible state. Would you brighten him up? Could you do something cute or funny? Well, I thought, what do you do? <laughs> cute or funny? So then I said to Eunice, well, I don't know. What I'll do. Oh, I know what I'll do. I said, I'll dress up as a Catholic priest. I've got a lovely black shirt and a crucifix. I'll wear that and go up. So I didn't park where I can normally park at the hospital. And I went in. I looked something. I'll tell you what. I looked pretty good. Black shirt done up to the hair and a little crucifix. I walked through into the oncology area just adjacent to the car park and the nurses went, oh, good morning, Father. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Father. And as I walked down the corridor, everything went well until an indigenous brother that I know that used to go to, to Calvary and I've known for years came out of the door working there as a social worker and looked at me and said, what are you doing looking like that? <laughs> I told him, he laughed and laughed. As I walked down the corridor towards the elevator, I could hear him roaring with laughter and telling everybody. I thought, I'm not going to go back through there. I went up to the bedside of this man and sure enough he was in a miserable state. He looked at me and he was so off-putting by his attitude. All his trust had been in a doctrine. And up until this point he was hale and hearty and now that had been taken like a mat from under him and all his petty doctrines had all fallen in a heap and he was in a bad way. Cut a long story short, I talked to him and he said, who are you? And I meant to say, meaning his son, oh, the bishop sent me. Because his son's a bishop, of, according to the New Testament. And I was about to say that, but I was so rattled by his bad attitude and his grumpy attitude, I said, the Pope sent me. <laughs> and he said, the who? I didn't know he was anti-Catholic. I nearly went through the side window at a rate of knots that would have made me look like an astronaut. Anyway, I finally told him that it was a joke and his son had told me and so, oh, yeah. Well, he wasn't moved at all. When I asked him, would he like me to pray? He said, oh, if you must. So I prayed and I said, well, look, I'll bring you some magazines. He said, why, when? I said, oh, when I come again. He said, don't bother, get out of here. And so I left. You know, some people put their trust in doctrines. And when their doctrines fail, everything they have a false comfort in fails with it. Our trust is where? In the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct your paths. There are other things that are really disappointing to people. The schools, the educational process, the God get out of school, you know, God get out of school. We don't want you in the school anymore. And this is common in many places, including parts of Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. What other things do we trust in? Well, <laughs> the Bible tells us we trust in each other. And some people are very foolish. They're always upset because people let them down. You know, I don't get that way. I get disappointed. But, you know, I can't trust people to be anything better than I am. And if you say to me, Tony, you're a very imperfect person, the answer, of course, is... What did you expect? I'm a human being. I have limitations. I have a bias towards failure. And I am what I am that is any good by the grace of God and the working of his spirit and my allegiance to the word of God. So, 
The Bible tells us in Micah chapter 7 and verse 5, put not your trust in a friend. You know, a friend can let you down. Why? Because they're malicious? No. Because they are evil of intent? No. It's because they're human, just like you. Why criticise them? Why be broken in spirit over them? Why be angry with them when they're just like you? So the Bible says your trust, meaning your whole weight of confidence, is not in human beings. Trust not even a friend. And Jesus, the Bible tells us in John's Gospel, when he moved into further ministry in Jerusalem at the Passover time, many believed in his name. John chapter 2 verse 23 And when they saw the signs he was doing, they were captivated. They were amazed. But Jesus, listen to this, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. I love many people. I have wonderful relationships with so many people. I have friendships that date back to when I was four years of age and I'm 75 in about three weeks. Four years old and I had a friend. We've never argued. Why? Do we agree with everything? No. I don't agree with some things he says. He doesn't agree with much of what I say. But we're one in Christ I have another friend that I've had for almost the same amount of time. Eunice's family I've known since I was four years of age. Wonderful friends. I have friends that are watching us somewhere in Australia and overseas that I've known since primary school days. Paul Schofield. Hi, Paul. Dennis, hi Dennis. Peter, hi Peter. Loved them then, love them now. Great friends. I've got cousins, I've got a cousin watching called John. I've got a brother-in-law, Philip, in Jakarta watching. Hi Phil. Love them. But my trust isn't in them and their trust isn't in me. They trust me as a human being but the trust that we must have that will keep us through the shaking and up to the return of the Lord, is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct your paths. People today are scared about child care, guardianship. People are afraid of the Bible because there have been fools that are claiming to be knowledgeable and yet hacking away at the Bible, taking things out of context, honing in on scriptures at the expense of the whole counsel of God and making it a ridiculed object. Ridiculous. The Bible tells us not to trust princes. Put not your trust in princes, in authorities. Put not your Trust, what do you think about this? In the legs of a man. That is the physical prowess, the ability of a man. And don't put your trust in your own understanding. Well, I believe this and that's it. Well, you're a fool, my friend. You're a fool. You have cut yourself off from the knowledge of God when you say, well, that's my stand and that's what I believe and that's it. My pastor was a wise man. Peter will barely remember him because he's about, well, I won't say how many years younger. Pastor Luke. You know, I would talk to him and say to him, now about this, pastor, what do you think about this? And he would just say, hmm, WFL. 
I said, what? When I heard it the first time, WFL. Yes, I said, I, I got the letters, but what does it mean? Waiting further light. There are some things you don't know. And the moment you claim you know everything, you have put yourself in the fool's basket. There are things we don't understand. I've studied for 20 years in depth. I've known about it longer than that, but 20 years of the Holocaust. I cannot just lunge forward with confidence in every aspect of that when I'm speaking to my Jewish friends who are yet to come to a knowledge of redemption in Christ. When they say to me, how do you see God in this? Oh, I've got the glib answer. I've got the off-patter answer. I've got the easy veneered philosophy. But have I got the truth? W-F-L. I'm not leaning to my own understanding. I'm waiting for the light. And so in closing this morning, we're trusting in only one. My trust is in the Lord and him only will I trust. The Bible tells me we are to trust him and Isaiah 12, 2 says, we will not be afraid. I don't know what's going to come next, friends. I don't know how this pandemic will work out. I don't know with the people just uh, abusing the law that has been laid down by the government of Victoria, whether there'll be even another strain as a result of them going out on the streets and out on the beaches and out in public places in defiance of government. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen in so many places. I don't know what's going to happen in Townsville, we're not gloating and saying, oh, well, we don't have it here, therefore we'll never have it here. Who knows? But I tell you what, I'm not afraid. Why? Because my trust is in the Lord. I will trust him and not be afraid. In a broader and a more important context, the writer to the Hebrews says, we're looking up to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I am trusting in him. Are you trusting in him? Yes. Praise God. Let us pray, shall we? And if you have any fear this morning, I don't for one moment ridicule you. I don't for one moment think you're a fool. I just say, the Lord give you peace. We're going to close in prayer for those that are here locally, physically. We're going to receive the tithes and offerings and God bless you. I'll just let you know what's on this week so you're abreast of it, reminding you that there is no gala night tonight for obvious reasons. Father, we thank you that our trust will not be betrayed in you. Father, we let each other down. Governments will let us down. Parents will let us down. Children will disappoint. Marriages will be hard and if not properly governed will let us down. Our spouses will disappoint. Our hearts will be broken. Father, we thank you. There is no flaw in you. There is no flaw in you. So, Lord, we pray you'll bless us wherever we're scattered today around the world, here in Townsville. For that we pray, your blessing upon us. For those we pray, your blessing, that we might have our single eye, that as the chorus has said, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Lord, we've never found a flaw in you, and we never will. You're altogether lovely. Lord, help us to have perspective and balance in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. And for those that are watching, live streaming on Wednesday night, 
Oh, I think that I can safely say that next Wednesday night, 7.30, live streaming, I'll be sharing something on the mark of God as compared to the mark of the beast. And there is a forbidden mark. I wonder what that could be. Find that out in Leviticus. God bless you. See you again, folks. Amen.